Well, we're still in our studies of the psychology of the Hebrews. We've dealt with body, soul, and spirit. Tonight we want to move on a little further with the idea of the way the Hebrew mind and thought expressed itself. There are other terms used as figures to depict spiritual truths. Another one of these is the heart. Now, why the heart? It's probably the most often used physical organ in the body. Why the heart occurs at least a thousand times. Well, the heart is the central organ of the body, and as such, it's the focus of the life of the body. Since the heart is the central organ of the body, it is the focus of the life of the body. And therefore, it quite naturally came to be used as a figure of the center of all spiritual functions. So you can have everything else in your body, but without a heart, you wouldn't have life, would you? It's the center and focus of the life of the body. So quite naturally, it comes to be a figure of the center of one's spiritual functions and spiritual life. The terms, actually two, but I don't think you need them both. They're quite similar. Lave, heart. This is the word for the physical organ and for the inner man. Lave can signify the physical organ, the heart, or the inner man. And as such, the word heart becomes a synonym for the nephish. Now, we've dealt quite thoroughly with the nephish, which is the Old Testament word for the soul, no, for the person. It can be translated soul in some cases, of course, but we've already shown you again and again the Bible many times translates the word that could be translated soul as simply the person. Nafshi is me, for example. And so the heart becomes a synonym for the nafish. The heart is then the person. Now let me just give you some passages. We won't look all of these up. We've got many. Psalm 51.10 the heart is a synonym for the nephesh, or the person, we're saying. The heart then stands for the person. David said, create in me a clean heart there. Now, he doesn't mean he's got dirt in his heart like dirt in a carburetor, in his physical organ. But he's saying, make me clean. You see, the heart is the person. And, of course, we have many passages like that. In Nehemiah 9.8, a faithful heart. Well, is your heart faithful? <laughs> it is, but still pumping, isn't it? <laughs> but he means a faithful person, doesn't he? Of course, it stands for the person. Psalm 101 and verse 4. A perverse heart is what? An unregenerate person. A perverse person, a perverse heart. Psalm 101 and verse 4. Leviticus 26, 41. An uncircumcised heart is an unregenerate person. And then we have both Jeremiah and Ezekiel speaking of a new heart. Well, he doesn't mean a transplant, does he? But a new person. All of these are persons. In Jeremiah 32, 39 and 40, Ezekiel eleven nineteen are just some of the places where it speaks of the new heart. And then, to show that it is expressive of the person, the heart, judicial blinding as judgment upon the wicked. Judicial blinding as judgment upon the wicked is called hardening of the heart. God says he would harden Pharaoh's heart. That was judicial blinding. He blinded him to see the meaning of the miracles that Moses wrought. He said he would do that. Exodus 4.21 we see God hardened the hearts of the Canaanites in Joshua 11, 18 to 20. He said, I'll harden their hearts so you can destroy them. That's judgment against them. Joshua 11, 18 to 20. Well, he means harden the person, doesn't he? He doesn't mean that he will cause the disease which follows 
with the hardening of the arteries. First of all, it stands for the person, that is for the nephish or the inner man or the person. Secondly, it stands for the feelings and emotions. So therefore, heart, we're saying, is a synonym for the soul or the person. The heart is a figure here of the seat or source of feelings and emotions. Too many to look up again. I'll just give you some to get you in the context of what we're saying. Deuteronomy 6.5, love with all your heart. Well, is, has anyone ever questioned what we mean when we say that? We're saying it all the time. We should love God with all of our heart, but you can't love God with this heart. So it means that that emotional aspect of you, your affections, emotions and so on, is to be centered on God. The heart is the center of the physical man, and so the heart becomes a figure of the center of our affections, you see. Love God with all of your heart. Leviticus 19, 7, to hate with the heart. Well, you can't hate with the heart, but everyone knows what you mean. means the person hates. Isaiah 30, 29, the joy of the heart. See, these are emotions. Psalm 25, 17, troubles of the heart. And then grief and fear in the heart. Deuteronomy 15, 10, grief. 28, 67, fear. All of these are emotions. And the heart, again, is a synonym for the will. Remember, the heart occurs a thousand times in Scripture. It's the most often used organ to speak of spiritual truth. It's a synonym for the will. Now, the person, or the nephish, wills. See, willing is a function of the nephish, or the person. So again, it's a synonym for the nephish, which is the person. For example, 1 Samuel 14, 7. We read, do all that's in thine heart. See, it's a synonym for the will. Do what you want to do, what you will to do. Do all that's in your heart. Ezra 7.10. Ezra had set his heart to seek the Lord. How do you set your heart to seek the Lord? Amen. You know, so much of this doesn't need any explanation because even yet today we use the same expressions. And there's a reason for that, as we'll get to later, why God uses physical organs. It ought to be obvious already. 1 Kings 8.18 it was in thine heart to build God a house. That's what he wanted to do, what he willed to do. So here the heart is a synonym for the willing and the desiring aspect of man. And then, again, the heart is a synonym for the mind. Now the mind is the rational consciousness of the nephish. We'll end up seeing that everything is really the nephish, but the nephish is a person. These are various functions of the nephish. The heart is a synonym for the mind. The rational consciousness of the nephish is what we mean. Now it's interesting, the Hebrew never depicted the head or the brain as the seat of the intelligence, like the Greeks and the Westerners. You know, get an education in your head, well, the heart was a synonym for the man, and so you never thought with your head, but with your heart, you see. So we've got passages like Judges 18, 17. He told her all that was in his heart. <laughs> we would say in the head, and it's not nearly as descriptive. He told her all that was in his heart. That is, he told her all he knew. That's Solomon to the queen of Sheba. Proverbs 3, 3, write the commandments upon the table of thine heart. What's he mean? That's Proverbs 3, 3. Write them on the table of thine heart. He means remember them, doesn't he? If you write them on the table of your heart, you remember them. Exodus 31, 6. Exodus 31, 6. A man is called wise-hearted. Not wise-headed. You know, the Old Testament doesn't have a word for brain. <laughs> That's one reason they didn't use it. 
because the heart said what he wanted to say. He spoke out of the heart, loved with the heart, had emotions with the heart. But it's him having this. The person thinks. How about Proverbs 23, 7? As a man thinketh within his heart, so is he. You know, he didn't actually say that. Proverbs 23, 7. You know what he said? As a man thinketh within his nephesh, so is he. Oh, so how is it translated in NASV? It's probably within himself. You wouldn't translate it as a man thinketh within his soul. There's where nephesh is the person, himself. As a man thinketh within himself. The imaginations of the heart, Psalm 73, 7. Well, the imaginations of your mind, really. Now, there's a word for brain I mentioned a moment ago. There's no word for brain in the Old Testament Hebrew, but there is in modern Hebrew because modern Hebrew would have a word for everything, even typewriters and computers and rockets. They're still spelled in Hebrew. In the Old Testament, there was no word for brain. The modern Hebrew word, of course, for brain is moak, if that means anything to anybody. It means gray matter. <laughs> Now, the varied usages of heart that we've shown you here as a synonym for the nephesh gives more insight into the nature and function of man as a nephesh. The varied uses of the term heart in the Old Testament as a synonym for nephesh, which is the person, gives us more insight into the nature and function of man as a nephesh. Man doesn't have a nephesh, he is a nephesh. Genesis 2, 7, God created man out of the dust of the earth, breathed into his nostrils the life of God, and he became a nephesh, a living nephesh. Even King James translated it a living soul. <coughs> So we've seen the heart is the figure of the inner man, that is the person. The heart is a figure for feelings and emotions, will and desire for the rational consciousness of man. Therefore, all of these things are simply functions of the nephesh. People get mixed up on mind and spirit and consciousness and subconsciousness. Everything from feeling to rational thought is a function of your soul. Our nephesh are you as a spiritual person which will clear the water for you. And then you can do your own study and prove that point. Amen. I've done a lot of study, and it's quite confusing. You read books on psychology and theology, and everybody's got an opinion. But you go to usage is what we do in Old Testament theology and New Testament theology, and you see that all of these things we mentioned are synonyms for the nephesh, the person. Let's look at Deuteronomy 6, 5, with Luke 10.27. And we'll come to a better understanding of how all of these things like mind and heart and soul interrelate. Deuteronomy 6.5 with Luke 10.27. Now you might want to turn to both of them before we read either one. Deuteronomy 6.5 with Luke 10.27. This is Old Testament, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Well, we've already shown heart is a synonym for soul, and might is simply with all the zeal and strength and affection you have within you. And then Luke 10, 27, Jesus quotes this, and said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind. Now, with the study behind you, you realize he isn't dividing man up like a jigsaw puzzle, saying, Now love God with your mind, love God with your strength, that would be the body synonym for the body, love God with your soul, love God with your heart, because your heart can't love, we've already shown is a synonym for the soul, or nephesh. So what we have here in this verse 
is the soul, which we've already shown, the person. Secondly, the mind, which is the rational consciousness of the person. Then thirdly, the heart, which is a figure for the center of the person's affections. And that's all we have here. We just have nephish mind and heart brought together to give different shades of meaning to the one thing, that with all of your being, love God. The soul, the person, the mind, the rational consciousness of the person. The heart is the figure for the center of the person's affections. You notice we emphasize person in each case. Keeping in mind the heart is the center or focus of the physical life, so it becomes the center and focus of spiritual affections. When Paul said in Colossians 3, 1, set your affections on things above, we would have just as readily understood him if he would have used the figure and said, set your heart on things above. An affection of the heart is really an affection of the nephesh or the person. All right, well, actually there's four. With all your strength would be your vitality. That is, you are a physical person and you can sit back meek and mild and pray like some people do, praise God in your heart. But with all your strength, you really love God, you see. You know what I mean? <laughs> love God with all of your strength. Not just, well, praise God, he saved me. And I try to get to church when I can, but... It's loving God with all of your strength. All right, that's what the strength is. The soul is the nephesh, is the person himself. The mind is the rational consciousness of the person, our nephesh. And the heart here, as throughout Scripture, is a figure for the center of the person's affections. He's simply using a variety of expressions to say, love God with all of your being. Mean it. And while the nephesh and the mind and the heart can be used together, like in this verse, to give different aspects of the one truth, nevertheless, the scriptures will show you that the heart and the mind are synonyms for the nephesh, our person. They're really not something different. You don't love God with your heart and your soul and your mind and your strength. You just love God with all of your being. That's what he said. Well, I dare say until we just gave you that, most of us would probably struggle with trying to explain that verse. Now, how do we do that? And what does it mean? But it's simply like looking at a diamond. It's all one diamond with different facets to it. He's showing us that the very aspects of man's nature, his mind, his strength, and so forth, and the heart is a synonym for the center of his affections, in this case, and the nephesh itself, the person, the soul, with all of you love God. Well, of course, we've already shown the mind can't be something different from the person, because Proverbs 23, 7 was a good example, I believe, of that, that as a man thinketh, in his nephesh, so is he. But you don't think with a nephesh. You think with a mind. So as a man thinketh in his mind, so is he. But the mind is a function of the nephesh. So he's saying, as you think, so are you. We can reduce it to the least number of words. That's all Proverbs 23 said. As you think, so are you. Can't be any different from that. How could it be different? You don't have to ask people, hey, why are you sick? Or why are you poverty stricken? Or why are you just one step out of the grave? Or whatever you want to ask them. Or why are you happy and joyful and Amen. prosperous yeah. and Amen. healthy? Amen. It's how they think. It's how we think. And we've preached on it, taught on it, pleaded, begged, done everything we know to do to get you to see that victory is won or lost right here. And I sure, as I say, don't mind answering questions. But so many of them wouldn't need to be asked if you just get victory up here. You wouldn't say, how long, Lord? We're not done with man's body yet. The inward parts, the intestines and stomach, called in King James the bowels. But inward parts is the literal phrase. 
I'll give you all of the words because in study like this, we have to have terms. For the inward parts, we have the me'e first. I'll give you the Hebrew and then we'll have the English because we got a lot of people know Hebrew in this body. Me'e, M long E, E H. And another is Kerev, Q E R E V, Kerev. And then the belly, the beten. These two are inward parts. But the belly is also used the same way, beten. The inward parts in the Old Testament become a synonym for the seat of the emotions. Hence, a synonym for the nephesh, or a function of the nephesh. The inward parts are used over and over, both the New Testament and the Old, for that matter, as a figure for the seat of your emotions, the source. When we say seat, we don't mean they're sitting, but the source. Now, why would the inward parts be a figure for the seat of the emotions and a synonym for the soul's function? Because it's the nephesh that has the emotions. See, everything will eventually trace back to the nephesh because that's you. Your mind doesn't think, you think. That's what we're saying. Now, why the inward parts? Well, that isn't an arbitrary use in the Bible because we actually feel and experience emotions right in that region. What's the first place you grab when you slip on the ice and almost go down, didn't Or that near collision. Or you hear something revolting. and You feel it right in the pit of what you call your stomach, but it's really everything from the bottom of the lungs on down. That's the way you're made. That's why emotion and things affect you physically, you know, like ulcers for the stomach. People say, oh, I feel weak when they hear some news. Your feeling weak is not in the head, but in the solar plexus. Now, that's not just a figure, actually, and it's a mystery. We don't know how God has made us. David said, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, but we really don't know how we're made. But actually, there's something there because I've done a lot of study in spiritualism and the occult because this is an area of ministry, and it's the solar plexus region, the inward parts region, stomach, intestines, that a lot of the energy comes forth from in seances and so forth for manifestations of well, demonic apparitions that they call appearances of the dead and what have you, but it's true. And I don't know if you've experienced it. I have when there's a heavy anointing upon you. That's where you feel it. There's something there, the way God's made us, the mysterious aspect of the life principle and vitality is not in the physical heart, but it's in the solar plexus. The Old Testament speaks of the reins. Not R-A-I-N-S, but the reins of a man as being the seat or source of his strength. I remember oh, on more than one occasion that when the heaviest anointings were on me, they would hit me just that quickly and it would be right in the solar plexus. I've actually doubled over. Not with pain or anything, you just lose all of your strength there. It's like you've been kicked, but it didn't hurt. <laughs> Can you imagine just being kicked as hard as you can in the stomach by a mule and it not hurting? That's the experience. Oh, there are other ways you feel the anointing, but that's the experience of the anointing. Then sometimes when you pray for people and they collapse under the power of God, you ask them where they lost their strength. Now, if they really analyze it, some people probably never thought that much about it. But if they really analyze it, they won't say, well, my knees got weak or my arms or felt faint in the head, but they lost all of their strength in the vital region of their being. Their heart didn't beat any faster or slower. I remember the first time after getting the baptism, I got prayed for and the gift of healing was given in me for a healing. And I'd be the last person in the world to fall on the floor if I knew it was going to happen. <laughs> 
because, you know, I've got enough reality and lack of artificiality and lack of hypocrisy in my spirit that I don't want anything artificial. So if I go down, it has to be God. <laughs> and as soon as this brother laid hands on me, this is way back in 1966, it's just like somebody kicked me in the stomach. I couldn't stand up. And we were so crowded up at the altar that all around me saw what was happening and held to me. Or I would have gone down. I've never been on the floor, but I would have that time. I prayed for a lot of people to end on the floor. And I'll be happy to be there. <laughs> if it's the Lord, I got delivered of all of my Baptist starch in 1966. But it's interesting, and this is nothing I could anticipate because I had just received the baptism. I wouldn't know anything about how it felt to be anointed. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't know how it felt to be anointed. <laughs> I'd just been preaching 14 years, but I wouldn't know it. <laughs> That's a fact, without the baptism. Oh, I was strong on doctrine, but, you know, you can get that in the head region. And I had it up there. Anyway, the inward parts, you see are quite important. And so these figures to speak of spiritual realities are not arbitrarily chosen by God because you think back how often that this is where you feel things. You actually experience them. Well, let's give you some texts. The inward parts is a figure for compassion in Jeremiah 31.20. We'll look up a couple of these because I feel this is about as important as the heart in its own right. Jeremiah 31.20. Now remember, if you have King James, it'll probably be bowels. That was a good socially accepted term back then. They even talked about moving the bowels, but they didn't mean what we mean. I was moved in my bowels. Well, you need to know that as we read because you don't want to miss the blessing of what we've already said. Inward parts, figure of compassion, Jeremiah 31, 20. Is Ephraim, my dear son, God talking? Is he a pleasant child? For since I spake against him, I do earnestly remember him still. Therefore my bowels are troubled for him. And I will surely have mercy upon him, saith the Lord. Well, the Lord didn't say my bowels, but he said my inward parts. It's this term, me. Compassion, Isaiah 16, 10 and 11, is a figure for pity. Isaiah 16, verses 10 and 11, a figure for pity. Can you feel pity down there? You sure can. You can feel compassion down there in the region of your inward parts. And gladness is taken away, and joy out of the plentiful field. And in the vineyards there shall be no singing, neither shall there be shouting. The treaders shall tread out no wine in the presses, and I have made their vintage shouting to cease. Wherefore my bowels, literally my inward parts, shall sound like a harp for Moab. Now, there's a groaning and a yearning in his inward parts is the expression. Not that God actually has inward parts, but he uses figures that we can relate to, you see. God is spirit. But he said, my inward parts shall sound like a harp for Moab. Well, there's pity. Jeremiah 4.19, distress. He felt distress in his bowels, literally inward parts. Jeremiah 4.19. Then here's a good one in the Song of Solomon. You might want to look that one up. Song of Solomon 5.4. My beloved put his hand by the hold of the door, and my bowels were moved for him. My bowels were moved for him. But literally, my inward parts. This is an expression of love. That's what she's saying. Her love went out to him. Now if we said, you know, my heart was moved for him, why everyone right away would know that's a nice poetical expression. But the other, she felt something for him. That's why the inward parts are used. Now that's not just an Old Testament figure because we have it throughout the New Testament. Take, for example, Philippians 2.1 in the King James Version. 
Paul says that we should have bowels and mercies. Let this mind be in you. You know, if there be any bowels or mercies. Well, literally inward parts. And the Greek is splunk non. <laughs> which is inward parts. Paul said, if there be any splunk non or mercies. Then the belly, we gave you betan belly. That's the seat of the emotions in Job 20, verse 20. It's a synonym for greed in Job 20, 15. Job 20, 15. It's a synonym for the person or nephish in Proverbs 18, 8, the belly. Well, the Hebrew language was quite picturesque, and concrete, vivid. Another organ is the liver. The liver. It isn't used much in the Old Testament, but if it occurs once, then it's a figure that the Hebrews used, of course. And again, it's a figure for something significant. Because it is the heavy organ of the body, it was regarded as the seat of heavy emotions. That should follow. See, the liver is the heaviest organ in the body. And so it's the seat of heavy emotions, in a figure, of course. It signified that part of the person that became weighted down with heavy grief, emotion, anger, and so forth. It's interesting that the Jews, the Hebrews, had only one word for the liver and for the adjective heavy. It's the same word, kaved. Kaved is liver or heavy, depending on the context. Kaved. In Lamentations 2.11, it's a figure for sorrow. Sorrow. Heavy sorrow. Jeremiah is lamenting the fall of Jerusalem, destruction of the people and the babies and the children. And his liver is spilled out because of it. It's used quite frequently in the Old Testament. Not too many uses to show this aspect that it's a figure of something. Generally, it's the literal liver, although the adjective heavy, which is liver, occurs in many passages. But those of you who have BDB, Brown, Driver, Briggs, Lexicon, will find that it in the Semitic languages it was used, like in Israel, as a synonym for the seat of the emotions. We also see an unusual use or unique use in Ezekiel 21, 21 about the liver, and that is for divination. Of course, if you've studied, no reason why you should, but if you have, one of the first things you see if you've studied in the area of the occult, tracing it back to the Babylon and all, that they used anything they could. Ashes, bird feathers, bird droppings, water in a cup, wine, egg yolk, the liver, you know, to divine by. They would look at it and make predictions. And the liver is mentioned there in Ezekiel 21, 21. It's one of the means of divination by Babylon, by Nebuchadnezzar. And of course the reason is because the way it looks, kind of sectioned, and because it is the big heavy organ, why it came to be regarded as a source of occult information. Then another term from the body is the neck, the oref. The oref, the neck. The neck is a figure to signify, guess what? Obstinacy, stubbornness, wonder why, an unyielding will or heart. Why the neck? Why not the face or the fist? We've got the fist today, don't we? Defiance. 
The quickest way to tell an unregenerate person is that way. <laughs> quickest way. If you've fallen into that habit, then start one way or something different. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> And again, it's no put down of the younger generation, but even when they don't realize they're doing it, they get a blessing. It's, and that's defiance. Yeah, the clenched yeah. fists should never be offered to God. Yeah, that's right. The open hand, supplication. Yeah. Well, anyway, why the neck? Well, it's a characteristic of the human race. When it wants to show, you see it in a child especially, but you see it in people when they want to show their stubbornness and obstinacy, is to withdraw the neck. Over and over in the Old Testament, God speaks of Israel, stiff-necked. Remember in Acts 7, Stephen said, you like your father, stiff-necked, so are you. It's a figure of stubbornness. You ever see a child when they want to defy or express their stubbornness? What do they do? They draw the neck away. You know, you try to pacify a person, they'll throw the neck away. That's the first thing you'll do. And while it is certainly characteristic of the whole human race, even more of Israel, it's just the nature of the Hebrew race to do that. You see it all the time. Now, that isn't mockery because it's in the Old Testament. That's just the way it is. You watch a Jew. Now, so say the Western European, he has another way. He has the clenched fist or the Nazi salute or whatever. But nevertheless, this is the figure taken out of the Old Testament. Now, let's notice how God speaks of the neck and how it is always in a negative context. That is when it's used as a figure. Proverbs 29.1. You want to look these up. Proverbs 29.1. He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. Now obviously it isn't talking about just having a stiff neck when you wake up or something. But it's a figure here of stubborn obstinacy, rebellion against the divine will. Second Kings seventeen fourteen is another. Second Kings seventeen fourteen. Notwithstanding, they would not hear, but they hardened their necks, like to the neck of their fathers. They did not believe in the Lord their God. Now there you have the explanation of what it means to harden the neck. That's not to believe the word of God. See, if we say, as we often do, doubt and unbelief are sins, we could say hardening your neck as you hear the word, is a great sin in the sight of God. We'd mean the same thing. And then in Nehemiah 9, Nehemiah 9, verses 16 and 17, and verse Nine sixteen, but they and our fathers dealt proudly and hardened their necks and hearkened not to thy commandments. That's how they did it, you see, and refused to obey. Neither were mindful of thy wonders that thou didst among them, but hardened their necks and in their rebellion appointed a captain to return to their bondage. But thou art God ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, great of kindness, and forsookest them not. Now twice there, he says they harden their necks and he tells you what he meant by that. They hearken not to God's commandments, they refused to obey and they rebelled. Then verse 29, and God testified against them that thou mightest bring them again unto thy law, yet they dealt proudly, they hearkened not to thy commandments, but sinned against thy judgments, 
which if a man do, he shall live. And they withdrew the shoulder and hardened their neck and would not hear. See, that's it. There it is all together. The stiff-necked stubbornness, I don't believe that. And then even when in love and pity and compassion, God would send his messengers to them, they would withdraw the shoulder. You see how that, you ever see a child do that? Have you ever done it? You have to watch. Or you may still be doing it at times. Hmm. You ever see a child do that? Well, it's quite descriptive. That's what God thinks of your neck. <laughs> now, there are many other parts that we could spend time with, many other parts and organs that are used as figures. I'll mention a few, but you can do your own research. Many other parts and organs as figures of spiritual, moral, ethical truths, like the expression in the Bible, eyes full of adultery. Feet swift to spread destruction. The tongue of a tail bearer. Idle hands. You can probably make up your own list. Now then, in conclusion to this part of the study, the significance of the Bible's use of the physical organs and the flesh to convey moral, spiritual, and ethical truths is because man, man is body soul, spirit, in an inseparable bond. There's no such thing as man without a body. He's incomplete. That's why the hope of the resurrection. No such thing as man without a soul or his soul going to heaven and all of that. He goes to heaven. He's the soul. And the spirit is from God. So... The significance of the Bible's use of physical organs and so forth to express spiritual truths is because man is body, soul, and spirit inseparably, vitally related, those three aspects. That's why emotions, God wants us to know this, affect the body. As a man thinketh, so is he. See, that verse should take on new significance now. Anger and worry will cause ulcers. Resentments will bring on arthritis. That's why people who know only medicine will tell you 50% of the beds in the hospitals are filled with people who are sick because of emotional stress. Worry, fear, anxiety, hate, bitterness, resentment. So the psychology of man... It is necessary to understand that from the Old Testament, first of all, because then you're better able, better equipped to interpret God's Word, the whole Word, and the New Testament. Because when you come to the New Testament, you don't get all of these expressions and uses. They're just used. Jesus comes right into the middle of the Hebrew nation and starts throwing out theological truths and teachings and expects to be understood. Have you ever thought how he never explained paradise or Hades? And yet, those are New Testament concepts. Even kingdom of God. He didn't say, now let me explain what I mean by the kingdom of God because that's what I've come to preach. He just started preaching it. He says the kingdom of God is at hand. Well, they knew what he meant because they knew their Old Testament. The whole Old Testament is the kingdom of God on earth through Israel. God was their king, literally. We're still under man. Four is man and his sin, but we're under A, the idea and nature of man in the Old Testament. Now, man in the image of God, its meaning, its purpose. We're still under the same heading because man in the image of God is still a part of the study of man as the Old Testament presents him. 
This figure for those who want it is Selem Elohim, the image of God. Of course, all of you know about Elohim. The image of God, Selem Elohim, is ascribed to no other creature of God except man. Well, you say, I already know that. All right, that's good. Then we don't have to convince you, do we? But why? That's the purpose. Why is he in the image of God? Why not the cow or the horse or German shepherd or beautiful canary or whatever in the image of God? So we come to the purpose. Man was given this nature because it was called for by the divine purpose for him. And since the central purpose of God in making man in his image was fellowship with God, then he had to bear some resemblance to his creator. Or, to say it another way, they had to bear some resemblance to one another. Yes, the purpose, man was given this nature the Selim Elohim, because it was called for by the divine purpose for him. Now that isn't the only purpose to have fellowship with God. There are other purposes, you know, like serving God, doing the will of God, and praising God, worshiping. But the heart of the purpose of God was that man might have fellowship with him, and God might have fellowship with man. So they had to bear some resemblance to one another. Now that's not insignificant, though it may seem trite if you're not really listening carefully. Take Genesis 2, for example, when God showed Adam this truth. Adam didn't know it yet. So I can assume maybe not all of you knew it yet till I told you. You just, well, I'm here and God's there. and I know you're supposed to get your soul saved and I'm mine saved. But really, most people don't know the purpose of why are you in the image of God? So you can have fellowship with Him, commune with Him. And so Adam didn't know this yet, and God brought all of what? All the animals that he had made just like he made Adam. They're both called nefesh kaya, living souls. That isn't what distinguishes them, and Adam doesn't know that yet. See, he's just been made. <laughs> he doesn't say, praise the Lord, I'm in the image of God. And you dog, sit. <laughs> that never occurred to him yet. So God brought them all, and he looked at all of them. Arabian horses. Yeah. Of course, that's before Arabia. <laughs> when I think of a horse that's really dignified, I think of Arabian horse, but somebody will fault me on that and say, how about many others? <laughs> well, I can name them Morgan horses and thoroughbred horses and so on. Shetland ponies. <laughs> we better move on. They're taking liberties with the text. So Adam looked at all these and you know what he discovered? They're not in my image. Hey, something wrong here. No response. No feel right toward this. Oh, I like you, dog. Or, or so. And it's fun to pal around with you, you know, to run up and down the garden. Now, I'm serious, although it's a bit facetious, but Adam, see, he had fun with the dogs and cats and leopards, you know. They didn't bite and kill. Nature did not become red and tooth and claw until after Genesis 3. And he named them. See, Adam could communicate with them. He named them according to their nature. He said, you're a bird. <laughs> you're a dog. You're a horse. And he wasn't just making names up with an alphabet, you know, like, well, let's see, if I use that name yet, let me go back and check my list. But he had that communication, but it wasn't satisfaction. Now, all of you know all that from Old Testament introduction studies, or do we have to go back and read that? The Lord God formed out of the ground every beast of the field and every fowl and brought them to Adam. But before that, he said, it's not good for man to be alone. I'll make him a help meet. Then he formed all these animals. See, to let Adam know that wouldn't be the help meet or the wife, see. 
Because he didn't have the benefit of all your teaching, know that people are supposed to get married and have babies and all that. It's just Adam. <laughs> God said it's not good for man to be alone. So then out of the ground, the Lord formed every beast of the field, every fowl of the air, and brought them to Adam. Amen. See what he called them, whatever he called them, that was the name. And Adam gave names to all the cattle, to all the fowl of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, he couldn't find a helpmeet. God knew that already, so it's no news to God. And so then he created woman, as you know. So man was created in the image of God. The purpose is so that he could answer to God. And God could answer to his need. So he's in his image. The meaning of Selim Elohim, what's it mean? It's a synonym for the unique inner nature of man, unlike any other creature. Selim Elohim is a synonym for the unique inner nature of man. It means he is personal, moral, ethical, spiritual, rational. Because that isn't said of the animals. Can't be, isn't true of the animals. The meaning of Selim Elohim is a synonym for the unique inner nature of man, which means he is personal, moral, ethical, spiritual, rational. It's important we see on the basis of all we've said and are saying that the image of God does not mean man is like God. That isn't what the Bible says, but that he is in God's likeness. And his likeness is personal, moral, ethical, spiritual, rational. The Bible does not say he's like God, but in his likeness. As we've shown, the Bible describes man as flesh and God as spirit. Man is not spirit, but he is spiritual in his inner nature. So therefore, he's like God. <laughs> See, without the spirit from God, he would not be like God. The spirit comes from God, Zechariah 12.1. Ecclesiastes 12, 7, we gave you those already. Another passage you need along this line, Proverbs 20, 27. This one I want you to look at. Because some of you still have questions about, well, what happens to the spirit after man dies? And we'll still answer that one if you need it. But maybe this will help you to see what we've already said. Proverbs 20, 27, the spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord. Remember when we said the spirit is from God? We just gave you the passages. But once man gets it, then it's called his spirit. So the spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord. You know what he means here by lamp, all the spiritual things we've mentioned. Well, man doesn't search inside himself. The spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord searching the inward parts of the belly. That is, the inner man. There are those terms again, inward parts and belly, which are synonyms here for nephesh or person. So man is not spirit, he's flesh. God is spirit. Man was made from the dust of the earth. God breathed into his nostrils the spiritual life principle and his image. All of those things we mentioned, rationality, morality, and so forth, being moral, spiritual. And when God breathed into dust, spirit, it became nephesh, soul. Before spirit united with flesh, Genesis 2, 7, there was no nephesh. It didn't exist prior to that. But once it comes into existence, it needed flesh and spirit to have nephesh. But once it comes into existence, it no longer needs the body to exist. It has to have the body to get started, but it no longer needs it. Because once spirit unites with 
the creation out of the dust, we have a living nefesh, living soul, person. So someone asked me last time, what happens to the spirit? Well, nothing happens to spirit. When spirit unites with the dust in Genesis 2, 7, soul results. If anything happened to spirit, you'd no longer have that because dust goes back to dust. And so the moment that mystery takes place of life coming into existence, then from that point on, you don't say, what happens to man's spirit? If you're going to say that, you really just, or you should think of it as a synonym for soul or the person. Because man doesn't have a spirit, that comes from God. But as soon as he unites with Adam's flesh, he becomes the nephesh, the soul. Then he never loses soul or spirit. And he's going to get his body back, you know, if he's a Christian and resurrection body. The way you should think of it is that after this mystery takes place, then the soul is spiritual. Unlike the animals, he has an irrational soul. The soul is spiritual. With an animal, the spirit just is the life principle, just gives him vitality, animation, life. Then, while we do have passages like 1 Thessalonians 5.23 that speak of body, soul, spirit, yet Paul isn't intending to divide man up so that you can categorize him or compartmentalize him and make him three different things. We talk about the Traducian theory and all of that, but these are just theological terms not out of the Bible. Man is body, soul, and spirit, but not separate. If he doesn't have them, then he isn't, except body, and then he's not complete until he gets resurrection body. So some are confused what happens to the spirit because man's body, soul, and spirit. Well, nothing happens to the spirit. The spirit makes the nephesh spiritual. We're not said to be spirits, but we are spiritual. 1 Corinthians 15. All right. Yeah. And it says in the Bible that God takes our breath away, and that's also translated as Ruah, spirit. So, yeah. so then isn't, isn't spirit, when God withdraws his spirit from man, man dies? Well, you just answered your own question, though. You said it's translated breath, and you have to take the context. There it would be just taking his breath away. And so it isn't withdrawing his spirit. It's simply taking his breath away. You see, if I hold my breath, well, that wouldn't be a good example. My heart keeps beating. But if you take the breath away, you've simply taken the physical life away from the body. You haven't done anything to the person, absolutely nothing. He's still there. As I say, if your eyes were open, you'd see he's standing right there. Wherever the body fell, it wouldn't matter. He's there. And it becomes very confusing, and you owe it to yourself to not only study what we're giving you, but diligently study on your own. It becomes very confusing if you try to divide man up and make him anything but nephesh. That's all he is. And the nephesh consists of body and spirit, which makes nephesh. As we said, the spirit is always from God. And again, you see, you have to take the whole revelation because there could be a passage where you say, I believe I could translate. Remember, you're reading a translation of ruach, which means breath, wind, spirit. You could say, well, I believe I'm a better translator in this verse, and I'll say God withdraws the spirit. Well, go ahead. But you've said the same thing. But you've missed it if you're getting him to take the spirit away from you. Because then you're no longer nephesh. You have to have his spirit to be nephesh. And the life principle is one thing. The Selim Elohim is the other aspect of what God gives to man that he doesn't give to animal. And again, we recognize, we have to recognize, all of us, that there's no way really to satisfy every question everyone might raise because Jesus didn't try to satisfy a single question Nicodemus raised about being born again, the spiritual new birth, and all that. I don't know how this works. I said last week to some questions. No one knows. And if they say they do, they might sell a book, but they're not telling the truth. <laughs> because 
if the Son of God isn't going to tell Nicodemus, then it'd be a little presumptuous for somebody to write a book about. They know just how the in breathing into Adam, the, his nostrils, the breath of life, he became a living nephish. How did that happen? Well, I mean, can we explain it? No way, any more than the new birth in John 3. It's the mystery. But we know that's what happens because in Old Testament theology, you look at usage. And yes, there are places where you can translate. That's why we teach you Greek and Hebrew. You can translate ruach as breath, wind, spirit. I don't follow the translations in Ezekiel 37 on the Valley of Bones. I think most of those translations could be spirit and better understood, but they've got breath and spirit and wind in that one passage with the same word, ruach. And I'm not saying that you couldn't use breath, wind, and spirit in that passage, but many places where they just say breath or wind, I would translate it spirit. That's not important with respect to basic doctrinal truths, but what you've got to see is you cannot, and the longer you stay with body, soul, and spirit, the psychology of man in the Bible, you cannot divide him up any more than you can divide God up. Father, Son, and Spirit, yes, three eternal manifestations of the one God. That's all the explanation you can give because that's all the Bible gives. He didn't have a beginning, as the oneness say, and others, that is Jesus. The Holy Spirit is not a power, he's a person. But still is one God. I don't know how, no one can explain that mystery. One brother said he fasted for 40 days and God gave him a revelation on the Godhead but no way to communicate it. <laughs> well, that's what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12. He said he had a revelation in the third heaven but he said, there's no way I can come back here and put it in words, there are no words. I think sometimes I'd like to try but I'm sure they know what they're talking about. Now, I'm still dealing with this because it's a part of what we've got to understand. When you come into the New Testament, Paul will use spirit as a synonym for nephesh. You see, because he's the great exponent of flesh-spirit theology. So many times, or at least on occasion, he'll use spirit when he really, if you'd have said, Paul, let's get real theological, he would have said soul. The person's what he meant. Like when he says, you know, that deliver that sinful man in the church over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, the spirit may be saved. Well, he means the person. He doesn't mean God's spirit he took back because God's spirit doesn't need to be saved. So it's a synonym for nephish. And nephish is always, well, should always be thought of as person. Well, let me rephrase that. Not always thought of as person, but its basic meaning is person. Of course, there are other ways you could use nephish. So we'll stay in muddy waters if we try to make man, body, soul, and spirit, though he does consist of that. But you can't separate that. He doesn't have his spirit going off somewhere when he dies, and his body goes to the grave, and if he got blew up, you don't know where that went. And his soul going off to paradise, see, man gets divided up. And you say, well, isn't he divided when the nephish, spiritual nephish, leaves the body? He certainly is, but we've already said over and over, that's unnatural. That's called death, and God corrects that in the resurrection. It's so unnatural. He says the gospel is correcting that unnatural situation about man. Someone else had a question. I don't know. I yeah, I don't know. Well, there's really no way to answer. Do animals continue to exist? What would you do with all those fish? <laughs> Countless, not billions, trillions of fish have lived. Surely all those are not going to heaven. So, you know, a lot of people say, well, my pet will be over there in the next... You know what we're talking about? How many... I don't want to be talking about what no one knows what we're talking about but myself and this brother, but do animals continue to exist? I believe there will be animals over there, but I believe there will be in the spiritual dimension these beautiful creatures of God, birds and things like we call them leopards here. I don't know what he'll call a leopard over there. I wouldn't be surprised to see many beautiful creatures over there that we call animals over here, that you communicate with as Adam did. 
through mind, not telepathy, that's occult, but just mind communication. I wouldn't argue with a person, and some have said this, God gave me a vision of my little puppy that died, and I'll meet him over there, my horse. Didn't Branham say he saw his horse? Well, I wouldn't argue with that. Who am I to argue with that? I didn't have the vision. (laughs) Then I leave open the possibility that a faithful servant who had a faithful pet or animal, God may somehow, why couldn't he give it a resurrection body? Our spiritual body is what I'm talking about. Why couldn't he? Nothing's impossible with God. But it's an area where we have absolutely no revelation, and all we've got is some visions by people, and you can't base your theology on someone else's vision. But I certainly don't rule it out. The image of God, I'll close with this tonight, denotes a special sacredness of personality unlike animals. The image of God, what we're saying, what does it mean? It connotes a sacredness of personality unlike animals. You see, without doubt, the Old Testament's teaching about the Selem Elohim, the image of God, without doubt, that is the most conspicuous testimony God gives of the difference between man and animals. But we see this sacredness of personality, for example, in Psalm 8. What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? Now listen to this. For thou hast made him a little lower than God, not angels as you probably have in your version. God didn't say that. David didn't say that by the Spirit. You have made man just a little lower than Elohim, God. And you crowned him with glory and honor, and you made him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. You realize what is said there, man? And this is after the fall. This is David saying it. You've made him just a little lower than God. That's why we said he's not like God. He's in the likeness of God. And because man is in the likeness of God, then like God, God can give him dominion like God has. So he put him over all the works of his hands. He put all things under his feet. He crowned him with glory and honor. Well, one day that dominion will be restored. Praise God. We'll start next time with the doctrine of sin in the Old Testament.